Hello everyone, my name is James Ryan and I am here today to um, talk about how to create a mandatory profile on Windows 10. That is Windows 10 version 1607 anniversary update um, with all patches current of today which is the 12th of December 2016. Um, as possibly some of you might be aware or you might not be aware um, I've done uh, quite a few <laughs> Windows 10 deployments for my sins and um, in the very early days mandatory profiles just flat out didn't work in Windows 10 um, really annoyingly um, mainly because I think there was some bugs in there we've got the new kind of start menu database thing that didn't seem to work too well with it and whatnot um, but um, mainly people use a mandatory profile to try and cut down on the load time. Now whether this is in a, you know, maybe like an open access area where lots of people use the same machines and you just want to give them a similar sort of um, lockdown experience when they log in. Or if you're using maybe a non-persistent VDI and you use something to layer the profile in on top like AppSense or Res or Sense Profile Unity. FS logics, one of many other things, and you just basically want a base mandatory profile to provide a default set of settings locked down. Whichever reason you have for wanting a mandatory profile, we're hopefully going to run through today how you would go about creating it on Windows 10. So, uh, without further ado, because it's very late at night, and I'm well aware that my wife is um, complaining that I'm not spending any time with her. Right, so what I've done here is I've got a Windows 10 build going and I've let it go on this virtual machine you can see here to this point. When you reach this point you need to press Control Shift and F3 which some of you may or may not know triggers what is called audit mode on the machine and it basically logs you in as just a sort of default admin kind of user but it lets you actually sit there and um, make changes to the default profile and then run a sysprep command with a copy profile flag if I remember correctly that will basically um, create, take that profile that you've edited and put that into the default profile for the machine which is all super duper uber cool and what you can do at this point actually is do a certain amount of customization of your windows 10 default profile you know if you wanted to do things like maybe set the home page set the default search provider customize the wallpaper the views anything like that you can put all that in there and then when your users use this mandatory profile i mean it's not really intended to be a mandatory profile, you use it as the default profile on the machine as well. So it's quite a nifty trick if you wanted to have a, a default profile within your image that has certain settings already baked in. This is one of the ways that you can do it. So hopefully this should be going into audit mode just about now and it hasn't just rebooted on me, which would be really, really annoying. Um, so there you go. You see, it's logging in now as an administrator and that administrator account is actually disabled but it's going to log us in and just give us the chance to run some some customizations on the um, on the profile that we're using so when it's finished logging in because hopefully someone for Christmas this year will buy me a brand spanking new computer because my lab's a bit a bit old and creaky at the moment I think I say that in every video I record but never mind. So once this logs in, we should be able to do that customization that's in there. One of the biggest bugbears that obviously we have with Windows 10 is that this initial first logon that you're observing right now takes such a long period of time to do. It's very drawn out. It's creating all of the modern apps in there and doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things and that's why it takes such an awful long time but hopefully part of the process of actually creating this default profile or this default profile which we were going to convert to a mandatory profile um, will get us around um, this sort of long drawn out awful logon that you have at the first um, the first instance of that okay so we're in 
that was a long one so the first thing you do is where you've got the actual sys prep kind of dialogue up here is click cancel on that get rid of that so now we're in audit mode so anything we do here um, will basically be reflected in our mandatory profile for forevermore uh, which is going to be used as the, the sort of first so first of all we're going to change the desktop background to something super funk so let's go in and do that if one can remember oh, no it says windows license has expired down there oh it might not let me change the default background because it's got let's not worry too much about the default background in that case let's just go in and customize views and whatnot so where's our old pal file explorer uh, i never get tired of how awful all this stuff on here is where's file explorer it's down there pin to the taskbar of course so some of the things we're going to change um sort of default rooms click that twice so what i don't like about windows 10 is you, it always goes into this kind of quick access view and you can change this by using a registry key of some sort which i just created no, more so what i need to do is go into turn on hidden items um sorry not hidden items i want to turn on f i'm having a good day at the time turn on file name extensions by default that's one of the most annoying things about windows that it doesn't let you um basically see the um see the file extensions by default so to change it away from this um default view instead of getting the this pc view what you need to do is quickly just put in a registry key and the registry key is hk current user software microsoft i don't know off the top of my head windows current version explorer advanced and the value i believe it, oops there's my clock going off um a new string no it's not a string value i'm having a bad day at the day having a video aren't I? it is a d word value called launch two and a d word value of one so next time we open up file explorer it should now go into the sort of traditional view where you see drives in which i find much more useful um right what i also wanted to do was quickly go in oops i don't need to update one drive thank you very much um go into internet explorer and change the home page to let's change it to our company home page that would be a cool one to do at home wouldn't it if it ever wants to open okay just about opened up now we get the usual warning and obviously clicking through these bits we'll get rid of those for default users so we'll get rid of that um see if i can remember how to set my home page so let's change the home page to htguk.com and what else did I want to do? I wanted to change the default search provider, didn't I? And how do we do the search provider again? It's in add-ons, I think, isn't it? Yes, it is. Let's get rid of Bing. It's not how I do it again. I'm having a nightmare again. That is how we do it, honestly. It's that long since I've done anything with it in here. Uh, maybe we should install Adblock Plus as well while I'm on. Oh, God. Right, where's Google Search? I've been past it, haven't I? Add Google Search in. Add it in. So now, so now if I remember rightly from tracking protection lists, we need to go back in there now, don't we? Ah, wonders, wonders, wonders. Right, we'll get there in the end. Default, bing, remove. Now, interesting if you use Edge, um, it uses what's called Open Search, where you have to actually visit the page to get it. So, I mean, obviously, if you use something like Google Chrome, you're not bothered because Google is the default search provider. But if you use an Edge, obviously, the default search provider is Bing. So, putting it into the um, default profile or the mandatory profile in this fashion would be quite a good idea, right? So, if customize the views, we can't customize the wallpaper, I don't think, which is a bit. Annoying. 
annoying. Um, can't I change it from it there? No, I can't because I haven't activated it yet. Uh, oh, who cares? We'll leave it at that one for the moment. But it's not that much of a disaster. What we will do is we shall run some PowerShell to get rid of a bunch of these modern apps. Um, so let's just run that as an admin. Now let's browse across to my file server. Uh, which will it be able to find? Because it's going to have to go out on the network. Oop, yes, it can. It just needs some credentials. Let me remember what they are. So that I can get my password right. Now, what you wouldn't want to do in this case is save those credentials <laughs> into this profile. So be very careful when doing little things like that. Because if those saved admin credentials got into the um, the default user profile, obviously they'd be there to be used for that particular share. So beware about ticking that box. So what we just want to grab is these lines of PowerShell from here. Um, when they finally open up. I'll quickly just run through what they're going to do. We essentially we're going to remove all of the modern apps, um, all of the provisioned modern apps except for the calculator, which obviously you want to keep, and we're going to remove the apps that are currently loaded into this particular user session as well. And then what we're going to do, so these two sets here do all that removal of the modern apps except for calculator. Now this here is going to remove edge contact support and some other Apex oops, pass packages that you can't normally remove the PowerShell by renaming the folders. And then it's actually going to create another Microsoft Edge file in the same folder so it can't come back. Um, and we're not going to worry about the other stuff in there because it's all been commented out. So let's just copy those. Um, I could have just run them through there, but you know, I'm an old dinosaur, as it were. So we're just going to let it do that. And you should see it removing all of those AppX packages out of there. Obviously, if you wanted to grab those yourself, you can visit some of my blog articles, which I will put some links to in the description here that should help you out with the various bits and bobs in here. So that's off doing those bits. Um, so we've changed the quick access, we've changed the search provider, we've changed the home page. Let's just check that the home page actually works. Yeah, it's got our homepage okay, so we just wait till this completes. So I'm using an evaluation um, version of Windows. Money, whenever you went audit mode, it says the license has expired and it thinks it needs activating and it won't let you actually change the desktop or anything like that, which is kind of annoying, but never mind. Um, Tell you what we could do as well while we're on is um, just switch Cortana down to an icon. You can see now it's moved on to the next command. And it's doing all that stuff. So we have the Cortana icon instead of the icon. We'll leave the task view button on there. What I might also do, because I'm a bit anal about things like this. Oh, will it let me? No, it won't. So I can't even uh, personalize the task bar. Annoying. Yeah, so it's going through trying to remove a lot of stuff. Some of this stuff can't be removed because it has dependencies or it's part of the operating system or something like that. So as this goes through, and we're just actually... That's an awful background on my PC, actually. I hope this isn't uh, making the it really an awful experience for you. Oh, that's even worse. Let's, let's just play with our backgrounds while we're on. Yeah, not convinced on that one either. The reason I haven't done it twice is because of a... Uh, yeah, that's a bit better. A bit easier on the eye, hopefully. So I'll just wait for this bit to finish. It's actually going to remove all access to the Windows Store as well. Um, so if you wanted to keep the Windows Store in there, there is um, some lines of PowerShell within the links I'm going to put there. Um, I just need to press return on this last one, do I? Yep. Okay, so that bit is all done. That's all power shellied up there. Um, so we should say now, woo, look what we've done to the start menu. But hopefully when we do the use the copy profile command, this stuff won't go across. Now if you were creating a default user profile, you'd have to sanitize this to avoid all of that 
horribleness appearing in a default user profile but because we're going to create a mandatory profile we get to use the copy profile command which is going to uh, hopefully strip all of that out for us so next thing we need to do is to go back across to the network here and grab this file here called unattend.xml just to quickly open this up this file is referenced in the article links I'm going to post as well um, you need to put this and on on the local hard drive of this machine and then reference it in a command we're going to run this bit here the copy profile true flag needs to be set and you also need to make sure you've got the path to your install.wim file in there which in our case is the D drive the mounted D drive after that you need to put in the version you use the edition so you're using of Windows which in this case is Windows 10 Enterprise as I said the the, the details of that unattend.xml file are listed in the um, links we're going to put in there but anyway we're going to just copy it let's just drop it into the C drive and paste it in there so next when we run this um, this sysprep command what should happen is we need to put a pointer in to um, to that XML file that we've just done. So the command we need is, and obviously I'm copying it from somewhere here, which is why I'm a bit disjointed. System32, sysprep, sysprep.exe, and we need a bunch of switches. We need generalize, we need ubi, which stands for out of the box, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> experience, as I remember. We need reboot and then we need slash unattend and then a colon and then the path to our unattend.xml file. Now sometimes you need to stop the Windows Media Player network service before you do this, but sometimes you don't, so I'm hoping this is going to work straight away. And he says, waiting. There we go. It worked. Hopefully. <laughs> There's still time yet. For it to go um, terribly and awfully wrong. So this is going to basically uh, do its stuff now. It's going to take um, the, the the profile that we're using at the moment for this kind of disabled admin account that it's using, and it's going to use that to generate a new default profile. But the problem is all of the uh, all of the if you were using this to create um, a default profile for your image, you'd have to clean it up a bit afterwards. But because we're actually creating a mandatory profile, um, w that bit is actually going to be handled for us. But when we log in for the first time after we um, reboot the machine at the end of this, you will think, oh my god, that looks a bit of a mess. But don't worry, that's not the, the, what we're going to be using as the base <laughs> for the mandatory profile. And actually what we have to test our monetary profile on we already have a machine built here that's not using the kind of messed up default profile that we're going to be using so we'll be testing it on this machine here so the idea is that you wouldn't you know be probably be creating the mandatory profile from a, a, a sort of genuine golden image as it were you just spin up another machine but try and make sure that that machine is of the same windows 10 level that the um, machines you're going to be deploying it to are you possibly um, especially if there's a profile upgrade a profile version upgrade between Windows 10 um, feature update versions you may need to recreate the mandatory profile but as long as you've sort of logged the steps that you've done it shouldn't be too much of a problem it should be fairly slick but that's a completely separate subject anyway the the whole mysteries of Windows 10 feature upgrades which can be um, extremely challenging, um, really. Um, Microsoft are very keen to kind of make upgrades very hands-off, you know, and for you to trust them to handle all of these feature upgrades. Which is fair enough, you know, that they are trying hard to make it a bit more, a bit less resource-intensive to keep up to date with Windows and things like that. But it's only going to take one big, huge screw-up for the, all of that sort of trust to evaporate and for for seasoned Windows veterans to kind of go running back to their sort of wipe and reload approach. So my current thinking is that we, from a sort of confidence perspective and a, a fallback perspective, um, we really need to, to leverage some extra migration technologies 
to help us, you know, um, be very slick in our Windows 10 upgrading, even if you're on the, the long-term servicing branch as well. Which again, the LTSB picks say, oh yeah, well that's got a 10-year servicing window. It's got an up to 10-year servicing window. But originally Microsoft said they would land a version of new version of LTSB every year. They certainly did it for 2015 and for 2016. Reading the latest documentation, it says they're going to land a new version of the long-term servicing branch for Windows 10 every two or three years. But but still, I mean, possibly every one or two years, even if you're on the long-term servicing branch, you will potentially have another upgraded version available. So it'll kind of like, you know, if you're on the current branch, you could be upgrading every year. If you're on the long-term servicing branch, you could be upgrading every two years. So you're still, with Windows 10, going to be in a real state of migratory flux, as it were. And it's quite essential for enterprises to really get their heads together and be able to adopt the, the right tool set, which allows them to, to kind of embrace the Windows 10 migration. Because, I mean, you don't get the wrong idea about um, what it is that I do. I like the idea of Windows 10 because you can be a lot faster to embrace new technology. Say a new feature gets built into Windows. Now, remember when we went from Windows XP to Windows 7? It took a long time to get from Windows XP to Windows 7 and all of those new features that were in Windows 7, the XP users were kind of stuck there for years waiting for the upgrade process to go. So I think it's good with Windows 10 that now if a new feature comes along, if there's a new kind of killer feature, I don't know, VR related or, or, or voice activation related or whatever it is, if there's a, a super new feature that comes along that everybody wants, because we now have this kind of rolling upgrade cadence, it's a lot easier to, to, to adopt that. And even if there's a two-stage thing required, you know, maybe Microsoft need to put some particular driver updates or some, some, some framework updates on before you can adopt the new technology, we could kind of get there in maybe a year. Um, so I think it's 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 not really that bad. I think it makes enterprises more agile, lets them adopt the newest, excuse me, coolest technologies without as much fuss and hassle and resource and management and planning as we had before. But the flip side of that is because now we've got all of our applications and they need testing and remediating and you know working with the vendor maybe to work out issues before we actually go to deploy them. We've got to be a lot faster in that servicing window that we have to get things done and to and I know Microsoft are trying to say, well the reason we've got so much telemetry is because we're trying to help you out with all these compatibility issues. Uh, whether you believe that or not, um, if you do believe that, possibly I may have a bridge to sell you. But all that notwithstanding, we, we've got to get this testing done. And particularly if you're in a, a sensitive vertical like finance or healthcare or anything like that, or especially where you've got weird and wonderful applications and hardware devices, you've got to get all that testing done. So putting yourself in the position to be able to do that testing so much faster is really key, I think, with Windows 10. And you, you pro probably need to buy into a stack of technology to help you with that so you know getting all your applications virtualized and abstracted keeping users data you know separated from the operating system and being able to make sure that data that's in weird places gets brought across every time there's one of these feature upgrades maintaining users profile settings file type associations all these things that have a um, tendency to be be reset by a, a, a feature upgrade you know um, so getting all of that in place and automating as much of that as possible is key. And even automating some of the testing, maybe use a, a technology like Citrix App DNA, if you're a Citrix house, to do all of that sort of stuff. As well. And I mean, once you nail down a process like this with a, a technology stack, what you really should be able to do is say, you know, we've got this down now, and now we can just keep rolling on with the upgrades. And if there's a problem, we can reload it, drop all the users' applications and data and whatnot back in there, and the users just had a slight interruption. They don't really feel that anything much has changed. And that's got to be the way to do it, I think, with Windows 10. And Microsoft do have a stack of technologies of their own, like uh, System Center Config Manager, user experience virtualization they have enterprise state roaming which they're pushing now which is their azure back thing they have desktop bridge that allows you to convert legacy apps to um, universal windows apps and things like that they do have a stack that kind of will enable this for you in future and i think maybe five six years down the line unless there's any huge problems um, or any 
legacy apps that won't come across we will say that stack made of all but right now for those next five years we've got to kind of bridge that gap somehow and that's what we're pretty uh, keen on um, uh, for the company that I work for HTG at the moment so I think I've done quite a wonderful job of talking um, completely about Windows 10 through those um, couple of reboots that we waited for <laughs> to happen here um, but all you know um, I not wasn't just um, opening my mouth and letting the, the wind blow my tongue around so to speak you know I'm trying to, d to give you you know if you sat watching this video a bit of an insight into what Windows 10 will bring from a, a perspective of enterprise challenges so if you wanted any more information about that hopefully I will be putting a video together pretty soon that kind of shows our sort of bridging stack in action and how you can embrace you know tool sets to do that sort of thing but if you um, want to get in touch with me about anyway just drop a comment in there on this video and we'll do it anyway enough waffle from me let's just flip through these bits I must apologize for the slowness of this Okay, cool. We will just blindly accept the EULA. Um, right. Um, it doesn't really matter what we're doing here, but just out of complete and <laughs> utter habit, I'm going to turn everything off. Turn it all off. Skip all that off. I could just skip past this. As I say, the user I'm creating now does not matter a bit. So let's get this user logged on. So what we're going to do when we log on, it's going, as I said, it's going to use that default profile that we've just created, but it's going to bring across all of the mess. So it'll look a bit rubbish. But it doesn't matter. What all we're going to do is we're going to pop the DNS servers in because my lab is a bit odd when it tries to use the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the normal router as everything. I need to point it correctly at my domain controllers. I'm trying to find a script to do that um, to actually flip the DNS settings but it never seems to work but anyway it's kind of like um, sort of going to a plumber's house and finding a couple of leaks isn't it he spends all day fixing other people's stuff so he can't be um, can't be bothered to, to sort out his own trade related issues so okay okay it's gonna ask me if I want to join a domain Let's get this done. As I said, this machine is literally going to be thrown away once we've used it. So, is the tab button working? Oh, it is. Never mind. Yeah, this machine is literally going to be thrown away, so it doesn't really matter about the, the local password or anything like that. Okay, let's tell Cortana to do one. Um, do you want to accept that? I know. Blimey, I clicked that six times to get rid of it. Cortana just didn't want to be dismissed. Um, again, cynical head on. Was that just my lab? Or was that Microsoft now kind of insisting that you will have Cortana? I think I've said this before, but it's quite interesting that um, Microsoft announced back in June that they'd had. 350 million endpoints currently running on Windows 10. Um, it's up to over 400 million now. They said in that time they'd had 7 billion search queries through Cortana, and they sound really, really proud of that statistic. You know, we're working out on that. That's about 20 per device. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, obviously a lot of people are particularly kind of turning Cortana off, so obviously not the uh, the uh, the great uptake that they hoped for with Cortana. I don't mind voice activated stuff actually. I've got one of these Amazon Echo Dots in the house, and it's really really useful for you know daft things like when you are kind of lying on the settee and you've just popped a, I don't know, a chicken in the oven or something like that, and you just shout out, um, Alexa, just set me alarm for 45 minutes, you don't even have to, don't even have to go away from the football, it's great, and it tells the kids jokes, <laughs> not all sorts of things, I think it's, it'll be doing it. I did see some really cool stuff on the internet, um, Joe Shonk, one of the Cirrus CTPs, using um, the Echo Alexa 
voice activation to build net scalers and that was like wow uber 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 because um you know how many server teams do you have with sort of lots and lots and lots of resource and time there just building things and stuff like that and you can now just shout at alexa and get her to them obviously this was all octablue integrated which is Citrix's kind of um you know it's their internet of things sort of um triggers and stuff that they've got which does really cool stuff so it's some really ace demonstrations of it actually people you know well um heckling people doing presentations by using octablue and twitter together to let people you know light up a board behind the speaker with insults and things like that but it's quite an, uh, an interesting way of saying how the, the whole internet of things can be leveraged um anyway um, a good bit of chatter to cover all up let's just quickly right so yeah you can see straight away down on the taskbar there we've got a missing icon which indicates that we should have that awful start menu now this is exactly what i expected so let us not panic so what I just quickly need to do is change my DNS servers. Obviously, you don't need to do these steps. These are just um, unique to my lab. What you would probably want to do at this point is just join the domain. But let me just quickly change over these DNS servers. Um, I don't know where to do it. It's nice how they spell center correctly on UK um, based machines now, isn't it? Not that the Americans out there probably agree that, uh, with my sentiment that it's now spelled correctly, but, but even dialogue box is spelled right. A dialogue, I'm used to saying the word dialogue written on PCs um, in the American format for so long now is that the real version of it just looks wrong. It's the same with um, with favourites that has now been spelled the correct way with a U in it, of course. And because I've seen it with just the O for so long using Windows operating systems, it just feels really weird and it looks completely wrong. So it's kind of kind of a bit like Windows 10. The more time you spend with it, the the more normal it seems. Did I just say that? Dan would never forgive me. Anyway, so what we should now be doing is really joining the domain. So let's just give it a name. Um, it's not that one, actually. If you're paying attention, look at the top of the screen there. I should have named that one 201. Um, that would have been good, getting a... Domain name, uh, domain name, a computer net bias name conflict. Net bias name still exists, of course it is. <coughs> right, so it should be able to, sorry, find the uh, DNS servers okay now. Let us just join this to the domain. Right, so yeah, the idea is now that we're joined to the domain, so what we can do is then just, uh, do you know, did I really even need to join the domain there? We could have just done that without joining the domain. Never mind, we joined the domain anyway. So what we're going to do now is boot it back up, log back in. And then what we will do is take the default profile and use the copy to command to copy it out to a network location. Super duper. So let's just sit through another reboot. Can I find anything interesting to talk about through this reboot? Um, probably not. Let's just sit through this reboot. Yeah, so hopefully when we use the copy to the command, the copy to does, you know, the, the, the kind of sanitization that you used to perform with a mandatory profile, it does do some of it. Now, it doesn't do the permissions for the registry and the file system, but it does do all the stuff like stripping the source username out. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> I've got a very bad cough that I've got from the children. Probably shouldn't be recording videos at this point. Um, but yeah, yeah, it will strip most of the usernames out of the registry. It'll get rid of the this sort of locally updatory kind of things like the start menu database and things like that. At least it did when I tested it earlier on. So we shall soon find out if it's going to make a complete and utter liar of me or not. In the meantime, actually, um, while that's finishing booting up, we do have... Oops, that's a great post. I'll jump over to my domain controller. Actually, I won't do this now because I haven't created the folder for it yet, so I shall just shut my face completely about that. I won't change it to use that yet, but that's the user we're going to use to test in JRAM M3. I've already brought one and two, so 
three is the uh, latest and greatest of my uh, test user accounts at the moment. I don't think I've brought them one and two. I think I'm using those for FS Logics profile containers testing. Yes, that's right. I certainly am. Okie cookie. So I'm going to log in as a domain admin so that I don't have problems accessing my folders across the network. And I'm hoping because this horribly broken default profile is set up. Incidentally, if you did want to just set up a default profile, what, when you logged in for the first time, you would have had to go in and sanitize that default profile by removing some of the, the garbage for it. Pretty much the, the, much the same way you used to do an old style mandatory profile. But actually the links I'm going to post to this um, in the, 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 the description of the field should give you some guide to doing that as well. Should you want to do that? So Okay, so we are logged on now. Right, so <coughs> it didn't take that quick to log on, actually. Um, I did pause the video there, because <laughs> I didn't want to fill it out with lots of blank time there, me trying to fill it in. So, right, now what we need to do is, let me just get my brain in, is copy the default profile because the copy to command is never available now the copy to command that we used to have in here is never available now unless it's just for the default profile this is kind of annoying because you used to be able to use the profile. so if you notice that copy to command there is actually available on the default profile but it's not available on any of the others now so we select this copy to command and <coughs> What we're going to do is we're going to create a folder in our uh, file store that we have and we're going to call it mandatory. Now, you need to put a V something on the end. If you're using Windows 10 version below 16 or 7, so the release version or the 15, 11 version, it will be a dot V5. 16 or 7 version and upwards is a V6. It may change to a V7 in future, so be aware of that. So we're going to couple it to uh, our domain controller, which has a share called File Store, and a folder called mandatory.v6. And actually, if we change this, this may be where I went wrong before. I didn't say that. Add authenticated users onto there as well. Didn't say that before. That might be why I had to mess with the permissions. Anyway. Yes, we will say yes to continue and get rid of all of that. So as this copies across, is it already done again? Apparently it has 207 megabytes of copies on this humongous <laughs> profile. Hopefully, what we've just copied across won't be the same size. Okie koki. So now we have all this stuff in there. Right. Now a key thing to say here is, first of all, as we just mentioned, that was 200 megabytes in size. Now, look at the size of that. 2.1 meg. <coughs> the reason is because it's streamed out a lot of the stuff, particularly the local app data folder, which it just basically assumes that you shouldn't take over. So that's all pretty cool. All right. So what we need to do is just make sure that the permissions are okay. Now I think by using that copy to um, that allow to use button that we possibly have. So yes, I can't say the permissions are okay. That's what I forgot to do before. Hold on. Other thing I want to do is just quickly check the registry permissions. So if on this machine we literally just run the registry editor, this is what I must have done last time, and if we go to the HK users hive and choose file, oops, load hive, and okay, we're already in the right folder. Now if you click the ntuser.dat file, which is obviously the registry file, I'll just give it a name. Right, just literally check the permissions on here as well. And they're all cool as well. Excellent. Just don't forget unload the hive afterwards <laughs> otherwise you'll lock it in use so the last thing to do is actually you delete this bunch of files here without any real issues just to strim it down a bit just rename this to interuser.man if you want to create a suit mandatory profile you have to 
create the folder with the same name as well, but we're not that bothered about that. What I'm going to put in here as well is just a flag file. So let's just create a text.mod called mandtree.txt and just put in there v6 so we know what it is. So we should be able to tell without checking the profile tab of the machine whether it's actually using that or not. Right, so we've done all of that stuff, right? So now this machine can be kind of more or less discarded now. Um, what is it better about? Let's just sign out of it. So let's quickly hop across to our Active Directory users and computers. Now, remember the V6 that we put on the end? When you're putting in the profile path, don't forget that you, in Active Directory users and computers, you can actually do this by a GPO as well. This time you don't put the V on the end. Whatever operating system it's logging on to, the system is smart enough to append that onto the end. So if it was Windows 7, it would look for a profile with a .v2. The release version of Windows 10, it would look for a v5. In this case, it would look for a .v6. So, 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 let us grab our other machine. And first of all, I'll just quickly log on as an administrator to make sure that we ain't got any copies of the user profile on there. We'll just show the user profile is loaded on this machine. Default profile, uh, your admin account I'm using, the built in admin account, and that default user zero, which I can't remember what that does. So there's no copy of that J rank and three account on that. Sure. True. <laughs> and I'll bring up my little stopwatch there. Now, because it strips out all of the local app data stuff, it doesn't have a start menu database. So it's got to create one, and it's got to create all the modern apps that it needs to create. Now, if you remember, we stripped out the modern apps with the PowerShell. So hopefully, <laughs> he says, it shouldn't take as long. I'm hoping for under 45 seconds. Let's, uh, let's get the password right for start. <laughs> Oh dear, 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 false start, false start. Doesn't matter because I missed the button anyhow for this stopwatch. Let's go for it. Oh, it doesn't look fast. How does it? The way I can tell that is, you know what it says, um, that bit at the start and then it changes to preparing windows after a, a couple of um, seconds. If that's generally under five seconds, it might not take that long to log on if it's more than five seconds it generally takes ages so i'm kind of sort of slithering down in my chair a bit now thinking it's just going to be rubbish and it's going to take more than a minute to log on let's see oh come on hey 40 seconds yes i will consider that okay for a first long but anyway let's have a look see if these settings are right so you can see there's not look we appear to have got edge back. It's interesting. Do you know why? Yes, doesn't matter. It's still going wrong. Reason is, uh, the edge removal was obviously a device based thing, and I haven't done it on this machine. <laughs> Never mind, because it's not a user based thing, those apps. But it doesn't matter. That was still a fairly smart logon, considering it may put in these three. Um, I saw it So, a monetary profile, that's not too bad. Really, 40 seconds. That's okay in, in in user land. It's got this customized um, start menu stuff on there because that's deployed by an XML file that I'm using via group policy. So that's all uh, cool. You really let's just check IE and see if it's got my home page on, which hopefully it should have. Yes, I've already pre-configured my home page, and when it ever loads, it's very slow. Um, I shall be talking to the web guy, and that's where my blog lives now. Just a quick bit of advertising. Um, with a picture of Donald Trump on the front of it. That was cool. Um, let's just do a search for something random like uh, Windows 10. And as you can see, it's giving me Google suggestions. So the Google search provider is there. What else did we do? Little bits and bobs. We got rid of Cortana, the big bit of the search. If we go to File Explorer, we should see it opens up in that default view. And if you click on View there, it's got file name extensions hidden. So all that stuff's in there. And just to check the final thing, is it actually a mandatory profile <laughs> that we're using? So what we're going to do is look in our user profile for that little flag file, and there it is. 
So we are using the monetary profile. <coughs> it has loaded the monetary profile. Just in case you think there's anything untoward there. Quickly fire the admin part of it up just to show you the actual profile type. You could do this by looking at the registry as well. Give it a crazy mad fool. And it should say it shows mandatory there. Whoopie doop. Don't worry about that question mark on there. That appears to be something that happens quite a lot on Windows 10. Don't know why. So it is using a mandatory profile. <coughs> Excuse me. The only alert it's got there is because there's no virus protection on there, so don't worry about that. Um, so now we can sign out, and that profile will be discarded. So there you go. At long last, we have a uh, working mandatory profiles on Windows 10. So for those of you that like using mandatory profiles, that have previously used mandatory profiles, if you have other technology stacks sitting out there that involve using mandatory profiles, there you go. That's a way of doing it. That's excellent. Um, I'm sorry it took me 45 <laughs> minutes to talk about all of this. Um, hopefully some of the um, some of the chit chat in the middle might be useful for you as well. Um, please visit our website, uh, htguk.com. And if you've got any questions, feel free to leave comments about that. But hopefully, mandatory profiles should be good to go on Windows 10 from now onwards. Thank you very much.